Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Sunday morning worship services, Lake Havasu City Church of Nazarene. Uh, we may still have some difficulties this morning with our technical online. If you have trouble watching us today at Facebook Live online, uh, go to our website later today by 12 o'clock or after. It should be posted there and you should be able to get the service just the way it was supposed to be. Again, we welcome you this morning. We're going to begin with some worship this morning, but let's bow our heads this morning for just a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you that even if we cannot all be gathered together in one place, we are all gathered together in one spirit. Would you bless the time we spend together today as we worship you, as we praise you, be with pastors she brings the message this morning. Would you bless our nation and our world today with healing, I pray in Jesus' name. Join with us now in singing a very familiar hymn to those of you who have been around as long as I have. When we all get to heaven.
John 1 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And we know that Word to be Jesus Christ, our Savior, the most beautiful name. You were the Word at the beginning.
We're going to sing together a prayer chorus, and then Pastor is going to come and lead us in our morning prayer. Join us, if you would, at home in singing free. This is the air I breathe.
so that all who believe will have life everlasting. Thank you for that promise and for all of the promises in your word, Lord. You are your word. Thank you for that. That we can open up the pages of our Bible and see you. To read of your promises and to know that they are truth. Thank you, Lord. You are the way and the truth and the life. We worship you with our own lives and obedience. We plead to you with our prayers and petitions. We love you with all that we are and all that we have. Nothing has meaning without you, Lord. We give it to you, knowing that you give back to us blessings abound. Your grace, your <laughs> presence, your love, and your life everlasting. Thank you, Lord. Amen. today, but we have a special, special celebration. I've been threatening to do this for years and uh, just now have perfected my Hebrew, so I think we can get through it. <laughs> okay, those of you who are here, the ten of you may laugh at that because you know I have a hard time pronouncing English words. Uh, so for anybody who has a background in Hebrew, just forgive me in advance. There are six words I'm going to attempt here today. And uh, I think they've created a little anxiety, but we, um, we're just so happy to um, have you tuned in and watching. And I am trusting that God is working in your life during the midst of all of this. So we are continuing our sermon series, uh, Discovering New Meaning in the Spring Jewish Festivals. And it was in Leviticus 23.2 that God said, these are my festivals. Well, because they're gods, and not just for the Jewish people of one time or, or one um, group of people for that one set of time and for all times, I believe that Jews and Gentiles alike can learn from looking at and, um, and studying some of these stories and some of the feasts and festivals and the traditions that go along with them. Uh, so one of the traditions, of course, are its tradition, and it's also biblically based, is the Jewish Seder. So you'll see that we have the Passover Seder, rather, um, a, a plate before us and some of the elements that go with that. Uh, for the Jewish people, people the uh, Passover begins uh, right around the corner on April 8th, and they celebrate that for the most part as an eight-day uh, celebration or feast. But that includes Passover on the first day, and then seven days for the um, Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we've talked about that. If you're interested, you can go back and look at some of the previous sermons um, in this series uh, where we go in a little bit more detail. But today I want to kind of focus on the plate and what that means to us. So the Jewish people remember the events of the Passover with the Seder every year on the anniversary of their exodus coming out of Egypt. That first Passover and the instructions for it are found in Exodus 12, beginning with verse 6. The whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. That same night, they must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with bitter salad greens and bread made without yeast. Do not meet, eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. 
The whole animal, including the head, legs, and internal organs, must be roasted over a fire. Do not leave any of it until the next morning. Burn whatever, whatever is not eaten before morning. These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals, and carry your walking stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. So many of today's practices and the Seder reflect these early instructions. They have the unleavened bread, the bitter herbs, which is salad greens or something like that, and then something representing the Passover lamb. It's not surprising that over the years, some of the allegorical interpretations of these items have changed and been added to since the coming of the Messiah. Christian interpretations of the Passover were established, however, on the Jewish interpretations of those early years. Jesus celebrated the Passover. It looks a little different now, I think, than it did when he was uh, on earth, because over the years it's been kind of layered upon with each generation imbuing new uh, meaning and adding new symbols according to their culture and their context. Similar to many Christian holidays, uh, there's some uh, holidays and some traditions that I'm not sure where they come from, and there's some good uh, conversations that can come from those. But after those original Jewish, those who followed Jesus, and those who did not follow Jesus, after those original Jewish interpretations, many Gentile allegorical interpretations were also added on it. And we can see on the internet there's many ways for both uh, believing Messianic Jews and uh, other Christians to understand the meanings behind the symbols. Now, in spite of all the different symbols and ways that we can interpret them, uh, in most Jewish households, there's five uh, obligatory um, symbols or things that basic obligations, they're called mitzvahs, that seem pretty consistent that are performed each year at the Seder. Those five things are that they would eat the unleavened bread, they actually drink four cups of wine or grape juice, they're very small cups, of course. <laughs> uh, they eat the bitter herbs or the maror. Uh, they relate the story of the Exodus, and they relate it with all these smells and taste and touching and the generations coming together and the asking and answering of questions. And then lastly, they recite the Psalms and some scriptures together. Unlike the holy days of Christianity, uh, which are most typically celebrated in a church, unless there's a coronavirus, uh, the um, Jewish people celebrate the Passover in their homes. It's a gathering with themselves and their friends or their neighbors where they come together. The Seder meal in many homes can last three to four hours with the singing of songs and the prayers and, of course, the telling of the story. It includes uh, everybody that's there for the most part. The word Seder comes from the Hebrew word order. So that refers both to the prescribed order of service and to the Passover meal uh, and festival in its entirety. Everyone receives a copy of a pamphlet known as the Haggadah. The Haggadah has in it the prescribed order of service as well uh, written out the songs and the readings. Uh, typically the father or the grandfather in the home would be the leader of the service. Mom would light the candles, which represents the very presence of God and the start of the Passover meal. The youngest child asks the four questions. Each of the questions begin, why is tonight different from all the other nights? The other children, or all the children, search for the apokomen, and we'll talk about that next week. Uh, other children would open the door for Elijah. Parents and grandparents also tell the story, and again, everyone <coughs> has a part in relating uh, part of that story and responding appropriately. So the Seder plate is the focal point of the proceedings of the evening. Whether it's an ornate uh, silver plate or a plastic plate or even a cloth, very uh, humble cloth, 
It bears the ceremonial foods around um, which the Seder is based. So we have the egg, the parsley, this is romaine lettuce or bitter herbs, the clay type mixture. Uh, this is where the shank bone or the lamb would be, the zaroa, uh, for vegetarians or people who can't get meat because it's all sold out. Uh, beets are acceptable where the, um, the juice of the beet uh, represents the blood of the lamb. So this is the representation of the lamb. And then another bitter root would be horseradish, and it could be a horseradish root or um, paste or uh, shredded. So the lamb shank, the zaroa, uh, sometimes it would be a chicken neck or another bone would be acceptable that is roasted, uh, prepared over fire. Um, it's that symbol that is representing the lamb, the Passover lamb. Remember, a lamb, young lamb or goat was uh, sacrificed and its blood put over the doorpost in the home. The Passover lambs were to be without blemish. Again, reminding us that Jesus Christ had no sin, no blemish in him when he died for us. When the death was pronounced back in Egypt by the Lord, every house that did not have the blood over it, the Passover lamb's blood, the firstborn child or animal died. Of course, we know that when we put our faith in our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, the lamb of the world, that our lives are spared. Second Corinthians 5.21 tells us, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering of our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. We can have that relationship with God because we take on the righteousness of Christ. Now some people understand the shank bone, I think it's shoulder or arm. The shank bone is also representing the outstretched arm of God who went with and before and around the Israelites. Deuteronomy 26, 8 tells us, He heard our cries and saw our hardship and toil and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong arm, or strong hand and outstretched arm with overwhelming terror and with miraculous signs and wonder. He brought us out of, to this place and gave us this land flowing with milk and honey. Next, we move to the beitza, that's the roasted egg. In the Seder meal, the, the egg is, sometimes they use a brown egg, but in, when you roast it, it just gets darker and darker. Uh, it's roasted in the oven, representing the burnt offerings that were brought to the temple during the festival in ancient days, the uh, um, second temple that was built. The egg also serves as a symbol of new life. Some great overlap here with our colorful Easter eggs pointing to new life in Christ. And of course, Passover always falls in the springtime when we can see new life abundantly outside. There's this rebirth in nature that reminds us of the liberation from uh, bondage in Egypt. For the Messianic Jews and other Christians, of course, we know that there is new life in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. The old life is gone and the new life is begun. What a wonderful picture for us that God gives us in the beautiful symbolism of the Passover. Now, while hard-boiled eggs are typically um, part of the menu, and the menus can vary in different Jewish homes, like the lamb, the beitza is not eaten. Since the uh, 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, there are no more sacrifices. Therefore, they do not eat the lamb or the beitza. The, it's a hard one, Kharaset. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's my first hard <laughs> Here, and this, it kind of looks like clay. I know you can't see it very well. Uh, but the Kharaset, it symbolizes the mud mixed with the straw used by slaves 
uh, by the, the Egyptian slave masters or telling them to make bricks. Uh, and at one point they hardly had any straw. But this represents the stray, it, the clay, the mixture. It can be made in a variety of ways. But um, it, a lot of times it'll have things like, uh, well, it almost always has apple and wine and um, nuts. Uh, mine doesn't have any wine in it. But it can also have dates and raisins and figs and apricots and pears and oranges and bananas and nuts and uh, many different spices, cinnamon, cardamom, and uh, coriander and others. Uh, the Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon, is significant in the Seder. In fact, the title for the Seder is uh, verse 216 of the Song of Songs. My beloved is mine. It's, um, like I said, it's the title, but I like what one rabbi points out. Uh, she said that all the ingredients for the very best harrow sack can be found in the words of the Song of Songs. For example, feed me raisin cakes, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. And your love is better than wine, an earth nourishing tree and vine, green figs and tender grape, green and tender fragrance. Come with me, my love, come away. <laughs> Adds a bit of romance to the dinner, but the Harriset. Uh, symbolizes more than just the clay and the things pointing to slavery. It points to just that sweet taste. Uh, we're reminded of God's love for us. And it makes the story of redemption all the better. It creates hope for the future. Truly, for the Christ follower, we understand the sweetness of God's love and compassion for us. Now, the carpas, this is the... Um, Green vegetables, it's the parsley, or celery, or watercress. Uh, I'm using the flat parsley here. And uh, during the Seder, it's uh, dipped into the salt water, uh, which is also on the table. One of the questions that, uh, of the four questions that the youngest child asked is, why is tonight different from all the rest? On all nights of the year, we do not dip even once. But on Passover night, we dip twice. The first time, we dip carpas into the salt water. And the second time, bitter herbs, that's the horseradish, in Heroset. So by way of teaching, then one Haggadah, the, the Haggadahs, by the way, the, the uh, what is said during the Passover, it varies from household or household or family to family. But one Haggadah says this, The first time, the salty taste reminds us of the tears we cried when we were slaves. The second time, the salt water and the greens help us to remember the ocean and green plants in the earth from which we get air and water and food that enable us to live. Let us all dip the parsley in salt water twice. <laughs> now notice this connection in the story from the days of their ancestors to them right here and now. See, we're remembering that, but we're also recognizing our own part of God's story. It's like this interwoven thread for all of us where our lives touch or are touched by God's story, like a, a giant quilt or something where we're part of those threads, we each adding our own uh, story, our own color, our own little bit of life that God has given us as a part of his big, beautiful quilt. It's a huge connection here. Another popular uh, symbolism is that the um, parsley is used because it represents, and this is mine, so it's getting a little wilted, uh, represents the broken backs of the people that were bent over from their days of affliction. And also points to, I can't quite pick it up, points to the dipping into the water, uh, representing dipping, dipping the uh, hasep branches into the blood of the lamb and um, putting it over their doorposts to be saved. Next we have the maror. Uh, that's the bitter herb, and traditionally you could use a horseradish root or some shredded horseradish. I have a little horseradish uh, sauce mixture, and that again reminds them of the bitterness 
of being in bondage, not only in Egypt, but the suffering of all of their Jewish ancestors and up to today where they're suffer, suffering. The Hazaret is a second bitter herb, and usually uh, this herb is the romaine lettuce. It can be used to make a um, special sandwich uh, of romaine lettuce and then some of the bitter herbs. But uh, now you might be thinking romaine lettuce isn't very bitter, but apparently the leaves are not bitter, but the root, which stays in the ground, is bitter. And I think if I were uh, doing a Seder with my family, uh, especially these days, I might talk about how the Hazaret could point to our world, which is broken, going back to our very first human uh, people who, who sinned against God and brokenness entered the world. And then, of course, we can then refer to how that will be restored. God will restore us and renew us and give us a new body and give us a new earth and a new heaven someday uh, as we put our faith and trust into Jesus. How his arms still extend around his people and the broken world. Psalm 136, 12 through 14 says that as God brought Israel out of Egypt, or that God brought Israel out of Egypt, his faithful love endures forever. Verse 13, he acted with a strong hand and powerful outreached arm. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who parted the Red Sea. His faithful love endures forever. That's a beautiful psalm and it, it goes on, but during times like this, in the midst of a, a pandemic, it is important to remember that his faithful love endures forever. Let me say it this way. It is important to remember. Remember what God has done. It's the same God. God is the same God then who is now. And his faithful love is happening right here, right now. I know it doesn't look like it, but God does not forget us. In the Old Testament, God commanded Israel to remember what God had done. Deuteronomy 5.19 says, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. In Deuteronomy 8.2, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness those 40 years. Deuteronomy 9, 7, remember this and never forget how you aroused the anger of the Lord, your God, in the wilderness. Now Psalm 106, 7, 8 tells us, when our ancestors were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses and they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Yet, he saved them for his name's sake to make his mighty power known. Immediately after, they believed his promises and they sang his praise, but they soon forgot what he had done and did not wait for his plan to unfold. We see this believing and remembering and things going well and then forgetting and disobeying and things not going well so well. See, like Israel, we're quick to forget God's miracles, his interventions in the past. Like Israel, we don't always remember God's love, particularly when it gets hard. We forget God's promises as if they're not true or they're not going to be fulfilled. They will be. We forget and grow patient in our waiting for God's plan to take place particularly if we're suffering in these bodies, which will be replaced with new heavenly ones for believers. And yet, God, by his grace, will be faithful. And yet, God tells us in the New Testament one of these fantastic promises. John 14, 26 tells us, But the Helper, I need a helper, <laughs> but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, 
These are Jesus' words. He will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Is that great? I hope you hear how amazing this is. This is really good news for us. See, you can say amen in your bathrobe with your feet up on the couch. This is the spot. God is with us and sends us his helper so that we can remember that God is with us. <laughs> it works out really well, especially if you're weak or you're tempted or you're discouraged. We are reminded by the spirit of who God is and what God has done as we continue to surrender to God. That spirit reflects and reminds us as we participate in the discipline required of opening God's word, God keeps coming back to us. Amen. He shows us how to remember. He shows us the things that maybe we wouldn't have noticed otherwise. He comforts us and calms us. It takes a little effort and practice. So practice. You talk about practicing things that are related to your personal responsibility and your social responsibility. This is it. You have a social responsibility to remember and then share with others so that they might know the truth, too. You want to make an impact in today's world? People are starving for comfort, for things to lower the anxiety that the news is lifting up. Well, the reality is God is with us. We Amen. know the story. We're told to remember it. He doesn't leave us. Watch how your anxiety about the future goes down as you remember God's faithfulness in the past. As you remember the character of God who will be with us faithfully, lovingly, forevermore. God is working in our midst. He has not forgotten. But he's asking us to remember Take time to praise God and to reflect and to share God's story with others. Remember, remember, celebrate, praise. We have access to the entire story of God. Be looking each day on how your path intersects God's story. You're part of it. We all are part of God's story. Open up the word and see where you fit in. It helps to develop and largen your sense of purpose. It brings comfort. It brings joy to know that we're just not here suffering alone, just like we're the only one that's ever suffered, the only generation that's ever had it hard, if you call it hard. Dig in and soak up God's words, especially in these days. It is sweeter than honeycomb. And as we remember, we won't grow faint. As we remember, we're more likely to be obedient because we remember there are consequences to sin. As we remember, it, it further deepens our identity with other followers in, the, in uh, God's family. It deepens our sense of belonging. It deepens our own love and compassion for others. As we remember, God tells us who he is and his love for us. As we remember, we're being obedient to what God's telling us to do when he says, remember. <laughs> when we remember, we're filling our minds with the things of God. That's better than filling them with the things of the world. Mm -hmm. As we remember God's story and history and character, we learn and ultimately understand God's love better. Praise God for who he is as you remember in the days to come. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that you offer us so many opportunities to share with the symbols and things of our world how you are interacting in our life. Lord, we thank you for your word that as we learn it and memorize it and know it, we get to know you better. We see you more clearly, and it helps us in our walk in this life that you've blessed us with. 
Lord, we want to be your faithful servants. Thank you for selling, sending us a helper to do that. Thank you for giving us a helper that helps us remember you so we can praise you all the more. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Pastor. And as we close this morning, and again, a familiar worship song we all sing together this morning, and we've been talking about how great our God is, and we want to share with that. And do we have a closing scripture? You know, we will have a closing scripture. I would say stand with us at home and sing together how great is our God. <laughs> Closing verse is from Job 37, 5 through 7, and also 14 through 15. God's voice is glorious in the thunder. We can't even imagine the greatness of his power. He directs the snow to fall on the earth and 
tells the rain to pour down. Then everyone stops working so they can watch his power. Pay attention to this. Stop and consider the wonderful miracles of God. Do you know how God controls the storm? Have a great week and fall deep in love with God. Thank you. Name above.